Greetings in our Saviour's name and welcome to another Glad Tidings, our programme. The first song that we're going to let you listen to today is Simply Trusting Every Day. And Yvonne has got a wonderful story about this great song. But the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And we want you to do that and we want you to listen to the song. And then my wife Yvonne is coming to share with you immediately after this song. So let's listen to it. And Mildred Rainey is the singer. Simply trusting every day Trusting through a stormy way Even when my faith is small Trusting Jesus, that is all Trusting as the moments fly Trusting as the days go by Trusting Him whate'er before Trusting Jesus, that is all Brightly doth His Spirit shine Into this poor heart of mine While He leads I cannot fall Trusting Jesus, that is all Trusting as the moments fly Trusting as the days go by Trusting Him whate'er before Trusting Jesus, that is all Singing if my way is clear Praying if the path be drear If in danger for Him call Trusting Jesus, that is all Trusting as the moments fly Trusting as the days go by Trusting Him whate'er before Trusting Jesus, that is all Trusting Him whate'er before Trusting Jesus, that Yes, Simply Trusting Every Day was written by a man called Edgar Page Stites. It is completely American in background. Stites was born on the 22nd of March 1836 in Cape May, New Jersey. He was a direct descendant of John Howland, who was one of the 102 passengers on the Mayflower ship. They had decided to escape religious persecution in Britain and live freely and independently in Massachusetts, North America. Stites belonged to the First Methodist Church in Cape May, New Jersey, for over 60 years, serving in the Civil War as a river boat pilot and later as an obscure but active home missionary to churches in South Dakota. Like many other hymns of that day, the poem first appeared in a newspaper and was handed to the American evangelist D.L. Moody. In turn, Moody gave it to his soloist and song leader, Ira D. Sankey, asking him to set it to music. He consented and a great hymn was written that has encouraged Christians for the many decades since it was first published in Sankey's Sacred Songs and Solos book in 1878. Ira D. Sankey relates the story of a minister 
who used this hymn to great effect just after it was published. He wrote, About two years ago I visited a woman who was suffering from an incurable disease. But, although her agony of body was great, her distress of mind was greater still. One day she said, The future is so dark, I dare not look forward at all. To my question, can't you trust yourself in God's hands? She replied, No, I can't leave myself there. I repeated the words of the hymn, simply trusting every day, and especially dwelt on the chorus, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting him whate'er befall, trusting Jesus, that is all. Ah, she said, I can trust him now, at this moment. Is it like that? I sang the hymn to her, and the change that came over her was wonderful. She never lost this trust, and she marked the page in her hymn book so that she could have the hymn read to her. After months of intense suffering, she passed away to the land where there shall be no more pain still simply trusting in Jesus, her Lord and Saviour. Stites' hymn was widely used in the great moody and sankey evangelistic meetings in the following years. This simple expression of childlike trust in Jesus has met the daily spiritual needs of many of God's people to this present day. Although he wrote many hymns, Stites' is principally remembered for two of them, Simply Trusting Every Day and I've Reached the Land of Corn and Wine. As teenagers, we used to sing the chorus of the latter hymn with great gusto. O oh, Beulah Land, sweet Beulah Land, as on thy highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea where mansions are prepared for me and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home for evermore. Many have already reached the glory shore. Some of us are still viewing it. Stites himself died on the 9th of January 1921 in the town where he was born, Cape May, New Jersey. And he was buried in Cold Spring Presbyterian Churchyard. This hymn reminds me of Louisa Stead's hymn, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, which I wrote about some months ago. Let me remind you about it briefly, and then Mildred will sing it for us. As Louisa, her husband and little daughter Lily were enjoying a seaside picnic at Long Island Sound, New York, suddenly they heard a drowning boy cry for help. Mr. Stead rushed to save him, but was pulled under by the struggling boy. Both were drowned. As Louisa and her daughter watched helplessly from the shore, with a child to take care of and no husband to support her, Louisa quickly became poor and destitute. But God was faithful. He provided for them and they made it through. This painful experience taught Louisa to trust and depend on God despite their desperate circumstances. Louisa wrote, I do not need to pray for love. God knows I love him, and I know he loves me. What I need is an extra measure of faith and trust to believe that his providence is still at work and that his hand can still guide me through the bleak, unknown future. One afternoon, when mother and daughter had nothing left in the house to eat, the two prayed earnestly that the Lord would provide. The next morning, Louisa found a large basket of food on their doorstep, along with an envelope containing enough money to buy her daughter Lily a pair of badly needed shoes. We trusted God and he has not failed us, she said to Lily. It was out of such experiences of trusting the Lord and seeing him work that the hymn was written, 
based on a verse in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. And so she wrote, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord." As a newly widowed Mrs. Stead walked through the darkness of loss, it was by God's grace that she persevered in her faith and trust in him. God's sustaining power rescued her from drowning in her sorrows, and in his comfort she learned to trust in him more and more. And now Mildred to sing it for us. so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know thus says the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, it's sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life. And rest and joy and peace Jesus, Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him o'er and o'er Jesus, Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him and Mildred. The Bible says they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion which shall never be removed and thank God for the steadiness and the anchor that trust in Jesus Christ gives us. Uh, he is our sure and steadfast hope and praise God today we can rest our future and all our circumstances and all our greatest needs and deepest needs on him and trust in him at all times. Thank God for that. Well, we're going to read just now from the New Testament Scriptures. I'm going to read to you from the book of Acts, and commencing to read at chapter 1 and verse 1. The former treatise or letter have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, 
and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now we do trust and pray that God will write his word into all our hearts and continue to speak to us now as we come to his word. And shall we just unite our hearts in a brief moment of prayer and asking for God's blessing upon his truth. Our loving Father, we thank you for the Bible reading today and for all that we have already heard through the earlier part of our Glad Tidings, our program. We pray that the Spirit of God will speak through the word of the Lord just now and that you will bless it to the people who hear, and that in everything our Saviour Jesus will be glorified and honoured. We pray in our Saviour's precious and worthy name. Amen. During the previous couple of weeks, and especially since Easter Day, I've been thinking with you about messages along the line of the resurrection and the ascended Saviour and his ministry and the fact that he's forever alive. As we come to Acts chapter 1 today, and I've read it to you, we are kind of reverting back a little bit to uh, the events between the end of Luke's Gospel and the beginning of the book of Acts. Luke, of course, wrote both these books and sent them to his friend Theophilus. And he's referring to the final words that were spoken by our Savior to his disciples before he was taken up to be with the Lord. And we have read in the passage a little earlier in Acts chapter 1, And when Jesus had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. We are deeply indebted today to Luke, the writer of the third gospel, and the follow-up record of Acts for the accounts of the final moments of our Lord's earthly presence and ministry to his disciples. Mark makes a very brief reference to the parting, but it's Luke who captures the momentum that built up to the actual ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the concluding remarks. We have the last short walk together out to Bethany, the closing benediction, and the awesome scene of Jesus ascending higher and higher until he disappeared from their sight. Immediately afterward, they were astounded by the appearance of two shining messengers. And what was their message? This same Jesus shall return in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Just as he departed, he will come again. You know, parting words are important, but the significance of Christ's final message cannot be overestimated. It was going to be the blueprint for the mission of these men and for the cause of the kingdom until he would return. The pattern is presented in the combined testimony of Luke's two accounts. Some very simple headings that will help you to remember the line and the message that I want to share with you today. First of all, 
There's the dominant message of the kingdom. And you find that in Luke chapter 24 and verses 45 to 49. We read these words. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, And thus it behoved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So here in this brief passage, the purpose of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ was to provide redemption from sin. The Bible, of course, emphasizes that and elaborates on that message as we read through the New Testament Scriptures because we read He appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. We read in the book of the Revelation, Unto Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And we say to that with the writer John, Amen. So it was not a surprise that this is the message which these men were commanded to preach throughout the world beginning at Jerusalem. And so it is in verse 47 that we have just read these words. And it is on the bedrock of Calvary's redemptive work they were to preach repentance and remission. That commission has never been repealed. Repentance may not be a popular message. People don't like to be faced with their sin, but it is an even less appreciated message to say you need to forsake your sin. And so your first challenge is the giving up of your sin. And there's no way around this, because Jesus said, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And everyone who is listening to me today, who has been to the cross, who has experienced the saving grace of Jesus Christ, had to come by that pathway, the pathway of repentance. There was a moment when we came to the cross. We not only saw that we were sinners and that Christ had died in our place, but in that same moment we were willing to give up our sin, to turn from it, and to start to follow Jesus. Peter the Apostle the great spokesman for the apostolic band on the day of Pentecost said, Repent ye therefore, that your sins may be blotted out. The apostle Paul said, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. John the Baptist preached repentance. Our Lord preached repentance. The apostles preached repentance. Turning from your sin. Turning away and seeking and following Jesus Christ. It may be somewhat bitter to swallow that pill, the pill of repentance, but it's followed by the sweet message of remission. And praise the Lord, there is a remedy for the unforgiven past. There is an answer to the accusations of an offended conscience and an offended God. And what is that answer? It's a free and full forgiveness provided through faith in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The song and hymn says, Love brought my Savior here to die on Calvary. For such a sinful wretch as I, how can it be? Love bridged the gulf twixt me and heaven, taught me to pray. I am redeemed, set free, forgiven, love found a way. So it is that when we read Luke's account of these men in the book of Acts, it is obvious they were faithful to their responsibility. They preached repentance and remission of sins wherever they went. And my mission today is just like theirs. It is to declare the message of repentance from sin and remission for sin through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it then becomes your responsibility to accept the message, and to act upon it. I am trusting that not only through Glad Tidings Hour, but through other faithful messengers who bring a similar message to what I'm sharing with you today, that you have repented 
and if you have never yet done so, that you will, and you will leave your sinful worldly ways, and you will turn around by the enabling grace of God to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Goodbye world, goodbye sin, goodbye devil, I'm through with you. Welcome Jesus. I'm going God's way. Well, the second important thought in our message today is the promise of the dynamic presence in their ministry. There is that fundamental message that they were to preach, but that message was to be accompanied by a dynamic presence in their ministry. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 49, we read these words. Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Now, there are many promises in the Bible, but here is one that's called the promise. The definite article emphasizes the importance of it. The promise of the Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. When we come into the book of Acts, and chapter 1 and verse 4, we read these words, Being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. When Luke was writing to his friend Theophilus, he was wanting to make it abundantly clear and to make sure that his friend Theophilus was fully aware that there was such a thing as the supernatural presence of the living Lord Jesus Christ attending the ministry of the apostles. God, the Holy Spirit, would account for the gripping impact of their preaching their fearless bravery in the face of fierce opposition at times, and indeed their triumphant testimony as they faced torture and martyrdom. They had no grand academic certificates to hang on their walls. It was the ordination of the anointing and the Spirit of God upon their lives that set them on their course. And when we think about it, the hostile forces that were arrayed against them the unpopularity of their message, it would have been no surprise if their mission had failed. But it was Dr. A. W. Tozer said that the church did not so perish like many other abortive sects before her was due entirely to the miraculous element within her. That element was supplied by the Holy Spirit who came at Pentecost to empower her for her task. For the church was not an organization merely, not a movement, but a walking incarnation of spiritual energy. In short, the church began in power, moved in power, and moved just as long as she had power. How profound those words are. If you were in my library and you see a small part of it, but right behind me here are some 19 volumes of A.W. Tozer's writings. What a man of God he was. What a powerful, pungent, cutting message he presented. A.W. Tozer. Someone said to me one time, a dear old brother in the Lord, he says, Brother Eric, Tozer was no dozer. And I'm telling you, he wasn't. He was a man for the moment. And he was a prophet indeed before our times, but a man for our times. That's the great crying need of the church today. It's the great crying need of individual believers, the unction of the Spirit of God upon our lives and upon our ministry. You sometimes go and you listen and you say, where's the power? Where's the dynamic? What's missing? There's something not there. And you long for it. You know that. And I pray that there is a punch and gripping power in the ministry of the servants of God. You will know it if the anointing is upon them. An honest analysis of the 21st century church 
is the uncomfortable presence of lukewarmness, compromise, and encroaching worldliness. Oh, for a fresh outpouring of the purifying spirit, consuming the dross and the dust that are smothering the flame of God in the hearts of God's people. Oh, for a new outpouring of pure power from on high, equipping us for the gigantic challenges before us. We really do need a divine revival of the Spirit of God on the church. And if it comes on the church of Jesus Christ, then I am sure it will impact an ungodly and sneering world around us. The third thought that I want to leave with you today is that there was a departing assurance to the disciples. First of all, a fundamental message, and that message needs to be clear all the time, sounding out the message of the cross, the message of repentance, the message of remission of sins, the message of a Savior who can save to the uttermost all those who come unto God by Him. Oh, may the Lord help us to ever be crystal clear and concise and sharp in our ministry and message so that people understand what it's all about. But then here at the end, we come to this great word. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. That's in verse 11 of Acts chapter 1. In chapter 24 of Luke's gospel, it says, He led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. That's verses 50 and 51. Acts chapter 1 verse 9, we read again, While they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. I wonder how I would have felt at that moment. I know what it's like when you part company with a special friend and you know you're not going to see them on this earth again. We have no account of how long those men stood gazing upward after his departure. But their concentration was interrupted when these two shining messengers appeared with this message, He is coming again. He is going to return. And over 300 times, we are reminded that Jesus is coming again. His purpose for returning is to bring an end to this age of grace. He is returning for those who belong to him. No time is revealed, so no time must be wasted. So it is in our case. The signs of the times are upon us. Well, there is no time to waste. There is the commission of the Master to work while it is yet day. And the night cometh when no man can work. And the commission that he gave to them in the interim period between that departure and between his return is that beginning at Jerusalem and into Judea and into Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth that the gospel of Jesus Christ's saving power is to be preached to all men. My dear friends, when we come to a certain age in life, we can't travel so much. And that's true in our own personal lives. We aren't able to travel now to the countries we used to be able to travel to, not with the same ease at all. But here we are from our own home in Northern Ireland, reaching out. And I don't know where you all are today, but I know that here and there, thousands of miles from us, there are some of you who have found glad tidings hour and you have come to know about us and you are listening to the message. My dear brother, sister, in Jesus Christ, how wonderful that we can send the message all round the world today in this wonderful technology that God has given to us. In a flash, in a moment of time, it can be where you are regardless of where you open up a Glad Tidings Hour program. Praise the Lord. 
for such a ministry. And our prayer is that you will not only come to the Lord Jesus Christ if you've never been saved, but that you will also open up your heart as a child of God and allow the Spirit of God to take complete possession of your being, to fill you with the Holy Ghost and power. This is the need of the hour, and there is no substitute for it. My brother, pastor, friend, dear one in Christ, we pray that the Holy Spirit will take full possession of your life and ministry and kindle a flame on the altar of your heart that will never die until the day that you are called home to be with Jesus Christ. Oh, may the Lord bless your ministry today. My pastor friends, God bless you. We're not tied to any one denomination, friends. We're tied to the book the Bible, and we love the Lord's people wherever they are, and we love you in the Lord Jesus, and we long for God's abundant blessing upon your life and ministry in this interim period. And someday soon, the trumpet will sound, and we will go to be rewarded for the work that we have done. May we bring many souls all the way home to glory, and on that great day, when the rewards are handed out, we'll be able to say, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name. Give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. O oh, my dear friends today, praise God for his word. And the Lord Jesus is saying to us today, occupy till I come. How important it was that those early believers were be endued with the Spirit of God for the great task of evangelism. Likewise, we too need that experience of the divine anointing before we engage in the work of God. Otherwise, we are weak and ill-prepared for the challenges that we will encounter. And may the Lord keep the issue before us today that someday soon He will come again. And we want you to be with us. If you do not know Jesus Christ yet, oh, prepare for his coming, and then you will be forever joy joyful and forever glad that we shared our hearts with you and shared the Word of God. Now, we're going to conclude our message and program today with a great song that we have played before on Glad Tidings Hour. And I thought this was be a very selective and very suitable song. Weave a story to tell to the nations that will turn their hearts to the right. story has ever been told. You know, there's no benediction and no amen to the book of Acts because the acts of the Holy Spirit are still being carried out in our world 
and will be until the Spirit of God is withdrawn from this earth. And may the Lord bless you and be with you now as we say our goodbyes to you again today. God bless you all. Bye-bye.